The RCMP Heritage Center is a not-for-profit charitable organization mandated to share the story of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. This is one of those stories, part of your heritage. I was actually born in Nova Scotia, in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Grew up in a very traditional family and um, was just graduating from Nova Scotia Teachers College when it was announced that uh, women were being accepted into the RCMP in operational roles. And I had never ever considered that. I was kind of a traditional young lady myself and uh, a bit of a victim of my uh, father's traditional ways and uh, thought that teaching was a wonderful profession, which it is, but I think as I was getting to graduation I was sensing that there was some, something missing, that it wasn't going to be the, the panacea of, of, my, of my future. So when the announcement was made, I actually was driving past our hometown detachment when the announcement was made on the, on the, uh, on the radio, and I just felt this incredible push to, uh, to apply. So I actually stopped that morning and applied for the force. And I remember walking into the detachment and the uh, young member at the front counter, I didn't understand uniforms or rank structure or what all these different insignia stood for, but there was a young member at the counter and I asked for an application for him and he looked a little surprised and he said, well, we're not hiring you know, staff at the moment. And I said, no, I want to apply to be a member of the force. And he said, no, we don't take women in the RCMP. And I said, yes, you do. I just heard it on the news this morning. And he had this kind of surprised deer in the headlights look on his face. And there was another member coming in the back door of the detachment at the time. And um, he called to him and said, uh, she says that we're taking women in the forest. And he said, I just heard it on the radio. And at that moment, I sensed that there was a, a, a huge turn in the paradigm for, uh, for the RCMP and I didn't sense at the time just exactly how huge it was but uh, it was interesting they gave me um, an application and uh, I filled it out and very soon after that I was uh, set up to write uh, an exam, the exam and uh, it happened to be general knowledge for about, uh, about the, uh, the subjects that I was teaching at the time so I, I apparently did fairly well on the exam and one thing led to another, and this was in May, and by August I was getting phone calls asking about my size and, and uh, when I could appear for uh, the medical and finalizing the, uh, the, the plans for uh, admission to the force on the 16th of September 1974, and for the RCMP that was, that was quite quick. So um, unbeknownst to me, this, uh, there was some, some noise around in the papers about the first women applying. Unbeknownst to me, when I went in the day to, um, to uh, actually be sworn in, it was timed that uh, in Nova Scotia it was uh, 1 o'clock, it was 12.30 in Newfoundland, and right across Canada our swearing in was, was timed so that uh, everyone could say that they were the first in the, uh, in the RCMP. So I was in, in the first class of, uh, of women to, uh, to apply and to be accepted. So uh, from there, it, it all happened very quickly. We were told to be at depot on the 16th or the 17th or 18th of September after our swearing in. And uh, I flew, some members drove, and we all uh, arrived at depot with these uh, bright eyes and incredible expectations. And I have to say a little bit of trepidation. I'm, I was thinking, what have I gotten myself into? But uh, it was an amazing adventure, I have to say. Well, it's interesting, you know, you had a sense that you were stepping on hallowed ground and, and the, the, the uh, 
I'd say the notoriety was was obvious right off right off the bat. They, uh, the uniforms weren't exactly well prepared. We ended up in a pair of uh, overalls for about the first month and a half because uh, there weren't the uniforms were far too big for most of us to wear the fatigues and the uniforms that they had. So we were in in overalls. Um, we were a little. Um, uh, aghast at some of the plans for our uniform. Our hats were little pillbox hats like you see on the gendarmerie in, in France. We had high-heeled shoes to wear, high-heeled Oxfords. Uh, the plan was also to have us uh, with our, uh, our guns, a small uh, measure of the uh, Smith & Wesson, in a purse, which was not a good news story for anybody. And even, our, even our firearms instructors were a little, little worried about, about that. But um, all in all, you know, people ask me a lot about, about Depo and what it was like. And as I said, it, you could tell that people were a little, if not cynical, maybe a little skeptical about, uh, about women in the force. But we had incredible trainers. And um, everybody gave us a, a lot of self-confidence about what we were doing and, and how this w um, experiment was going was gonna to turn out. To me, it wasn't an experiment. It, it just was something that had to, had to succeed. Um, I remember the first day um, I arrived on an airplane and some of the um, girls in my troop were arriving by car and a uh, member of my troop that um, actually almost escaped uh, drove up right in front of our uh, barrack block and the drill sergeant happened to be walking by and uh, she mistook him for I'm not sure who maybe a doorman or whatever but uh, she apparently asked him to help her with his with her bags and he quickly told her uh, quite loudly because we were on the second floor and heard the commotion that she'd better be able to get her luggage upstairs herself or she should go home. So I think she was going for the go home option when uh, we ran downstairs and grabbed her luggage before she could get away. And um, we realized at that time that it was going to be quite an, quite an adventure. And of course we were all uh, used to being a little more pampered than we were at, uh, at Depot, but it was, it was an amazing experience. And I think for anybody, male or female, who goes through that kind of training where they push you to your absolute most extreme potential, that it's, it's an experience you'll never forget. With having no frame of reference of what it was like for, for the males, I think the biggest adaption were for the other recruits that were there and for the, the uh, instructors. Uh, we were there like every other recruit just having this moment of, uh, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? Just like they'd done for 100 years before. Mm -hmm. My first detachment was a little place called Salmon Arm, British Columbia. Being from the Maritimes, I thought that had to be on the coast, but it wasn't. It, it's in the middle of the province, a beautiful little town. Um, Trans-Canada Highway uh, goes right through the middle of town. So it was a, a bit of a hub, a bit of um, uh, a good town for getting the basics of, uh, of policing. There were 12 members there, uh, no specialized units. So you handled everything from a car accident to a homicide until they were able to get you know, somebody else from, uh, from, the, uh, from headquarters out to, uh, to assist if it was a very serious crime. So the, the training was, was amazing. Um, unbeknownst to me, my staff sergeant had been uh, uh, very positive about having a woman in, uh, in his detachment and really wanted to make a statement about that. So he had all the members in first off and said that he really expected that they would give me as much support as they'd give any of the other members. So when I got there, I got a wonderful reception and um, I felt very welcome and uh, very um, uh, cared about, much as we were led to expect it would be for a new recruit in a, in a new detachment. So uh, it, there were a lot of younger members there and there was lots of work. So I, uh, I, learned, I learned fairly quickly. I had uh, about two months to work with a trainer and then summer came. So everybody was going on holidays. So I got my own shift fairly, fairly quickly with about two and a half months service. Started working um, a graveyard shift and uh, back in the day, and this, this I think ages me a little, but uh, we had um, no port, there's no such thing as a portable radio then. We drove big police cars. So a um, bit of a funny aside, my staff sergeant, the first night shift I had by myself, he called me into the office and of course there was no overtime then. So I came into the office and he sat, sat me down and said, you know, you work your, working your first night shift and you know, told me that you know, if I needed some backup to make sure that I called it 
and uh, not to be overly brave because everybody called up back up when they needed it. And then he produced a pillow and said, I want you to sit on this pillow when you're driving around in the police car. And I said, well, staff, I can see fine. He says, well, that's fine, great, but nobody can see you. And you need to look bigger in the police car if you're going to be working by yourself. So I could have, I could have taken offense to that, but I thought that's probably really good advice given the, given the environment and that I'm working alone. So I sat on my cushion and did all my night shifts. And as I said, with, without a portable radio, when you got out of the police car to check someone at 2 o'clock in the morning, you had to get back to your police car if you, if you needed help. And uh, fortunately, I don't have sad stories or bad stories to tell about uh, my time in policing. I'm, I, uh, I've, I was lucky enough in situations to be able to handle those situations and uh, deal with uh, the issues as they came along. From Salmon Arm, I was transferred to Kelowna, British Columbia and uh, uh, earned a, a position on plainclothes there, first on a, a drug section. Of course, being one of very few female in the females in the division at the time, um, there was a uh, need for, for females to, uh, to start doing drug work and lots of things for, for women to do in, in those kinds of, uh, those kinds of uh, uh, investigations. So I was lucky enough to get on a, on a, a quite busy drug section in Kelowna and from there was transferred to um, uh, major crimes, and I had that job for seven years. Did a, a lot of a lot of drug work, um, a fair amount of work with uh, uh, victims of child abuse, and um, was on uh, the serious crime section. There did armed robberies and homicides together. So we did uh, we did uh, a lot of uh, really interesting police work. I remember when I was on uh, on major crime, there was a. Um, a child, um, about eight years old, who had been sexually abused by a neighbor who, to the family, was a, a grandfather figure, he and his wife. But as it turned out, um, when grandma wasn't uh, watching, um, the surrogate grandmother, he was um, sexually abusing this, this, uh, this child. And so um, I got um, through the investigation and uh, with some forensic evidence, we were able to um, get enough corroborating evidence to, um, to take this to trial. And of course, for a child of that age, one of the big issues is having the child sworn. She was a lovely child and well brought, brought up by her parents and, and uh, with l as luck would have it, in a family that was quite, um, quite religious. So she totally understood about um, the Bible. And, and so when they talked to her about um, swearing on the Bible. She knew exactly what, what that meant. So I think the, the defense really relied on the fact that she would not get sworn. So we went through some of our forensic evidence to begin with, and of course, then she had to, to get, on, get on the stand. And uh, I had the day before brought her to court to show her what the courtroom looked like and to let her sit in the judge's chair and to walk her around and show her where she'd be and where I'd be and where her mom and dad would be. So just to make her feel a lot more comfortable because at that time they weren't cutting any slack for uh, um, using screens or anything like that for, for testimony. So we spent about a half a day um, around the courthouse and, and uh, just getting comfortable with that. And she was really holding up well. So um, the next day when it, it came for her to, uh, to um, testify, she walked in with her little Cabbage Patch doll, got up on the stand, and um, the judge asked her, you know, how do you, um, what do you know about the Bible? And uh, she said it was the word of God or whatever. And he said, what would happen if you, what are you supposed to do when you put your hand on the Bible? And she said, always tell the truth. So the judge decided to swear her. So she gave her story to the prosecution. And then in cross-examination, the, um, the defense counsel said, um, the constable had you here yesterday. And uh, she said, yes. Did she tell you what to say? And she goes, she told me only to say the truth. And so he was actually convicted. Well, as a matter of fact, he pled guilty soon after that, but would have, I believe, been, con been convicted. So uh, in it's interesting. You know, you, you look at uh, some of the things that really matter in your life. And that, uh, to me, that was a, an investigation I'm, I'm very, very proud of. The Canadian tradition has been 
that the police and the community are one and the same, that especially for the Royal Canadian Mount of Police, we have been in communities and made them safe in the past as settlers arrived. We were there for First Nations. We stood for um, security of the country as it grew. And I believe the Canadian tradition around being a peace officer, and I think those words are, are used almost exclusively in Canada to describe the police, really defines the difference between enforcing the law and creating peace. And I've always seen what the police generally in Canada do, and certainly what, uh, what we do in, in the forest as, as really causing peace to happen, to make people safe and to give people confidence that their communities are livable and, and places where they want to bring up their children. I, well, I had one more transfer from Kelowna to um, North Vancouver Detachment and um, big city policing and uh, working operational uh, positions there as well and loving it, absolutely loving it. And um, you know, when you, when you work with, with folks on those kinds of, well, any kind of police work, you become very close with the people that you work with because it really is life and death, day to day. Sometimes you don't realize it till afterwards, but people really depend on one another for their safety. So you get to be very attached to the people that you work with. And I found that in Salmon Arm, I found that in Kelowna, and I found that in North Vancouver. So in North Van, we were busy doing some incredibly interesting work as well. I was taking um, uh, evening classes in criminology. I wanted to get a criminology degree. And the staffing people phoned me up and asked if I was interested in getting a law degree. The forest at that time sent one person from each division uh, once a year to a certain law school if you could get accepted. So um, I actually said I'd have to think about it because I was just, I was having my dream job with a dream team and really enjoying the work I was doing. So I, uh, I said, I'll have to call you back. I'm going to have to think about this. And there was a dead silence on the other end of the phone that I'd have to think about it. But anyway, and then I talked to my sergeant and he explained to me that I just couldn't, I couldn't say no to this opportunity. So I gave it a little more thought and he reminded me that you, know, you don't stay in the same team forever and that, you know, um, this uh, job I had was just a transfer away from being something else. So I took the opportunity and uh, got into UBC Law School. I had to apply and, and get accepted, of course, and uh, I did. And uh, ended up um, going to law school at uh, UBC. Did three years and graduated in 1990, which really changed the whole path of my career. From then, um, someone with a law degree, they don't, uh, they don't send them back to uh, operational police work right away. I ended up uh, prosecuting internal affairs cases in Ottawa right after that. When I was in Ottawa, the folks that I worked for there um, started uh, suggesting that I should try to become a commissioned officer. So at that time, the process included uh, just uh, uh, an endurance test of studying admin and operational manuals for a year so that you almost memorize them and sit down and write this, uh, this exam on how quickly you could find a certain uh, uh, statute or a certain um, precedent in, uh, in the admin or, or operational manuals. And it was a really tough exam to write. Everybody worked, studied together, and, and, uh, and then if you got through that, then there was a, a quite an extensive uh, interview to become an officer. And the first time I wrote the exam, I did fine, but the first time I had my interview, I uh, didn't do so well. So I, I uh, was told that I should get a little more experience in, uh, in the leadership side of things and, and come back, So, which was great advice. And I, um, I ended up spending another year uh, doing research and looking for opportunities to uh, talk about leadership and uh, experience leadership. And when I came back the next year, I did quite well and got commissioned to North Battleford, Saskatchewan. I went uh, second in charge there. Well, I w again, um, I was the first woman to be commissioned in the, in the RCMP bit of a notoriety all over again. Once I'd, I'd thought that I'd, I was starting to be a, a household uh, occurrence, all of a sudden I'm the first woman commissioned in the forest. Going to North Battleford, North Battleford Saskatchewan, which of course is the, the, uh, the bedrock of, uh, of the RCMP. And uh, when I arrived, people were again very curious. There weren't a lot of uh, female members in that, in that part of Saskatchewan at the time. 
and uh, I ended up working for a, a great boss. And as I've, uh, as I've noted and I talk about all the time, leadership creates vision. And m most, if not all, of the people that I've worked for have had the vision to encourage other people to step up to the plate, take the high road, and, and, and do the right thing, which is an amazing um, mentorship to have. So um, when I got to North Battleford, uh, he and I would worked together in Kelowna before that. So uh, he'd already sowed a very positive road for me to, uh, to step onto and uh, put me in charge of most of the operational um, programs in North Battleford because that was my background. So my credibility was uh, already established almost before I got there. And uh, we worked very well together. And uh, I think North Battleford uh, uh, was happy to have us as a, as a team there. And I really enjoyed the opportunity. In, in the RCMP, when you, um, there's uh, inspector and superintendent positions. And then there's another level called chief superintendent and above. And I got a phone call that, uh, uh, people wanted, were, in, were interested in seeing me compete as a chief superintendent for a promotion. So again, you have to, I had to sit before a, a board who gave me the nod to, um, to be able to compete for a chief superintendent's job. And about two weeks later, the commissioner phoned and asked me if I would become the criminal operations officer for Saskatchewan, which was very exciting because, of course, I had worked there as a, as a young inspector and knew the province, knew the, the incredible work that was being done there and uh, was very excited to be in charge of criminal operations there. So I uh, came back to British Columbia. By this time, I had married um, uh, another member who was a widower with two teenage children who weren't quite as excited about leaving British Columbia for Saskatchewan. But you know, Saskatchewan has an amazing hold on people. And within a couple of months, my whole family was thrilled to be here. We. Um, we spent two years here, for the first year as a criminal operations officer, and the second year I was made the commanding officer here, which was a huge privilege and a uh, uh, great opportunity. Being the commanding officer of a province like Saskatchewan, and specifically Saskatchewan, it has its own innate responsibilities beyond just operational policing, because it has such a great history with the people of Canada and the people of Saskatchewan, and it's a relationship. I think that, um, certainly from my own experience, the people of Saskatchewan almost have an ownership of the RCMP that I haven't seen in, in other places. And they're proud that the force uh, lives here, that the force trains here, that um, the RCMP polices the vast majority of, of, of communities here. When I became the commissioner, there was, there was people used to tease me when I was uh, a young member that, um, I had said a couple of times, probably in my weaker moments, that my aspiration was to be the commissioner because it really was the farthest, farthest thing from my mind. Um, I have such respect and admiration for that, for that office. And of course, growing up through the traditions of the forest, an awe, an absolute awe for the, for the position. So uh, when I was uh, appointed the commissioner uh, very quickly in uh, late 2006, it was like a fantasy. It was like I couldn't believe this was actually happening to me. Um, as, you, as is said, Bev Busson from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Um, I had um, been asked by the Prime Minister to take the job on about a Wednesday, and the announcement was going to be made on, on a Friday. And uh, they had to, of course, have, uh, have it signed off by the Governor General. And I was told not to, not to tell anyone that this was going to happen. And, I hope the Prime Minister forgives me because I actually told my mother so she wouldn't have a heart attack when the announcement was made on, on, on Friday morning. But uh, I have to say, and by Monday I was, I was in Ottawa, um, walked into the Commissioner's office and couldn't believe that I got to sit in that desk. It was just an amazing feeling with an uh, honour beyond belief. Responsibility as well, it, it, it's, um, it's awe-inspiring, but at the same time, for, uh, for me, I wanted to use it as an incredible opportunity to make sure that the membership, who were at that time feeling a little embattled, had somebody at the helm who understood their struggles. And that was really, that's what I wanted to, uh, 
to uh, have as a message to, uh, to the folks out in the field. When I look at my own career and look at what it's meant from the moment I joined as a young constable through my career to retiring as, as a commissioner, I think certainly two things come to mind. One is about being, being a member of the force. It's, it's a huge privilege to wear the uniform. It always has been and it, it always will be. But with that, as you move forward in your career, you, you start by being a leader in the community as a young constable. And as you move on, you become a leader in your own community and in the forest. And I really noticed that one of the things that really helped me as I moved along is, is to remember that just because you have an important job, it doesn't make you an important person, that you're still there to do what needs to be done for the folks that are working alongside of you to get, to get the job done. And I've, I've had um, a number of people talk about the fact that, you know, as I move forward in my own career, I, I tried not to um, distinguish myself or separate myself from, from the working folks. And w when I was in Ottawa as the commissioner, I used to love to walk into the cafeteria and uh, go and sit down with a couple of constables or corporals or sergeants and just have lunch and find out what their day was like, what their struggles were. And um, it would be like a deer in the headlights when I walked with my tray through the, through the mess. Of course, the first thing was some people thought I should be eating in the officer's mess with the other officers, but I really wanted to find out what was really happening. So um, people would almost have that look on their face like they, uh, they hoped I wasn't coming for their table. But we sat down and we'd have a nice visit, 15 or 20 minutes, and I'd have my lunch. And, and um, I gained a great insight every time I sat down about something that, that, uh, that someone wanted me to know. And certainly from, uh, from a perspective of, of people that, that are watching the forest and, and of course nowadays there's huge concern about people in authority, privacy issues. Um, I think I would like to remind people that policing and the, the police men and women in this country and the uh, the members of the Royal Cana Canadian Mounted Police are people's sons and daughters, um, n nieces and nephews, and they've all joined the force to make a difference. They step out every day and do incredibly brave things uh, with, with very little, um, sometimes very little backup and, uh, and in some cases, unfortunately, very little support. And uh, I think we all have to remind ourselves that they are the guardians of uh, between good and evil, and we we need to remind ourselves of that every day. From my own experience, I joined the Royal Canadian, Canadian Mounted Police for an adventure and to make a difference. And over 33 years, there wasn't two days in a row that I went to work that I didn't have that expectation fulfilled in spades. Uh, it's not something that you can be convinced to do. It's almost like a calling because you do live the life. It's not a nine to five job. It's not something that you you uh, walk away from at five o'clock in the afternoon for any number of reasons because you get so involved in the work you're doing. You learn to care about the communities that you live in. But that puts so much meaning, certainly in my life. And I think if you're looking for a job that, that um, makes a difference and puts meaning to your existence and leaves a legacy to, uh, to the next generation, that it's an amazing opportunity.